When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind. The Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three-quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means little ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone, the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week. And it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. There were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events. They can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March, but the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The site is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. 
nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini-tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second-largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. Enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. Fisher swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, they witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's the reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano and its Volcanic Explosivity Index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, 
it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super-eruption would be ash and ashfall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super-eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super-eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super-eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. 
If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1,300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. You look up and see a bright orange flash in the sky. A bit later, you hear a boom so loud, the window panes around you burst into pieces. And then you see it. A giant piece of space rock burning high above your head, heading for Earth. When it touches the surface, the explosion leaves behind an enormous crater. It's 12 miles deep and as wide as Lake Michigan. After that, three quarters of all living organisms on our planet are on the edge of survival. This event took place about 66 million years ago. And the bright flash in the sky was the very asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. These days, people have many ways to protect themselves. Like we could hide in bunkers deep underground and survive. Such bunkers would already come in handy since there are many asteroids in the sky. And some of them are just waiting for their ticket to Earth to wreak some havoc. For example, the asteroid 1990MU In 2027, it'll come alarmingly close to our planet. Many people fear that Earth's gravitational pull will trap the rock, which is the size of two Brooklyn bridges. In this case, it'll start to move closer and eventually crash into the planet's surface. Such an impact would cause a shock wave that would be felt on other continents. Once the asteroid hit the ground, there would be an explosion. 
It'd be so bright, people would think a new sun appeared right here on Earth. The collision would release a huge amount of energy that would then turn into heat. Everything around the impact site would catch fire. And if the asteroid fell in the water, it would cause tsunami waves higher than the Empire State Building. Many coastal cities would be flooded. The dust that would rise after the explosion would cover the sun. The world would be plunged into darkness. If the dust stayed in the air long enough, the climate on the planet would change and Earth would start to freeze. If you think such a small meteorite can't cause serious damage, look at the Chayabins meteor. It hit the Earth in the winter of 2013. When the space rock entered the atmosphere, people miles away heard a loud bang. The brightly burning object was approaching the surface at about 11 miles per second. Halfway through the flight, it split into several pieces. This caused several stronger shock waves. When the meteorites hit the ground, it caused a major earthquake. And the aftershock from the explosions shattered the windows of 5,000 buildings. People in six cities around the crash site felt the aftereffects of the fall. And this meteorite was only 60 feet wide. Fortunately, the asteroid 1990 MU will move past our planet. We'll be safe. Whew! But the next asteroid to approach Earth is going to be 3 miles wide. It's called 3122 Florence. If this giant hit our planet, it could wipe entire continents off the face of the Earth. In 2017, this space rock got awfully close to us. It could be seen in the sky even with a small telescope. Now, the next asteroid is the biggest one to worry about. 1999 JM8. It's about as wide as Manhattan. And it has an unnerving habit of approaching Earth a bit too close for everyone's liking. A small asteroid named 2020 VT4 got closer to our planet than all others have ever done. In November 2020, it flew over the Pacific Ocean at an altitude a bit smaller than the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. That space rock was about the size of a big car. If it did make it to Earth's atmosphere, it would burn up completely before touching the ground. Falling asteroids and meteorites aren't uncommon on our planet. Luckily, most of them burst into flames and burn up before they enter the atmosphere. Mars is to blame for such frequent meteor showers. The planet isn't far from the main asteroid belt in the solar system. Sometimes, the gravitational pull of the red planet grabs asteroids from there. Then, Mars spins them around and flings them in our direction, just like a slingshot. So, Mars is a bully. <laughs> Good thing we're protected by Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it has an incredibly strong gravitational field. It keeps the asteroid belt in line and protects us from being constantly hit by a rain of meteorites. And that's good news, considering Ceres is in the asteroid belt. This enormous space rock is so big that it was once considered to be a planet. Then, for many years, scientists called Ceres an asteroid. But in 2006, it was finally classified as a dwarf planet. This space object contains a third of the total mass of the asteroid belt, which is about 4% of the Moon's mass. If Earth were as large as a nickel, Ceres would be about the size of a poppy seed. So what if an asteroid several miles across was heading toward our planet and people had to stop it? Well, we could break the space rock into smaller pieces. A massive explosion could be used to do this. People wouldn't even need to land on the giant asteroid. Getting close to its surface would be enough. Boom! A powerful burst of energy would split the asteroid into several large pieces and tons of debris. The smallest rocks would burn in the heat released in the blast, and it would also change the asteroid's trajectory. The larger fragments would burn up while entering the atmosphere. All witnesses of this unusual meteor shower would have a chance to admire a beautiful fire show. Another means of protection could be a kinetic battering ram. Simply put, it would be a huge object that people would send towards the asteroid approaching Earth. Or it could be a heavy spaceship. This is the method scientists produce to prevent the asteroid Apophis from falling to Earth. This guy is 1,200 feet across and often passes by our planet, coming as close as 19,000 miles above Earth's surface. The asteroid is going to pass close to our planet again in 2029. And there is a possibility that in 3036, 
it might crash into the Earth. If it happened, the explosion would leave a crater more than 3 miles across. Within 6 miles of the impact zone, all buildings and subway tunnels would be crushed or severely damaged. The event would also trigger a powerful earthquake. In the area of 30 miles away from the crater, car windows and window panes in houses would be shattered. And 75 miles away from the impact site, the earthquake would move furniture and buildings. One way to stop such a catastrophe is to build a heavy spaceship. It would take off from Earth, speed up, and then ram into the asteroid with great force. This impact would alter the course of the huge space rock, and it would fly past our planet. We could also try to stop the asteroid by wrapping it in foil. This would make its surface reflective, and then solar pressure might gradually change the asteroid's trajectory. Another alternative is using the gravitational tug. In this case, we would send an unmanned spaceship, large and heavy, toward the asteroid. It would fly over the space rock and slowly draw the thing closer with its gravitational pull. A small change, of course, would be enough to make the asteroid fly past our planet. Another way to protect Earth would be to build a system of giant lenses in space. Perhaps you've tried focusing sunlight with eyeglass lenses. Then you know how hot this sunlight can get. Now imagine having many giant lenses that are all directed at one point. Scientists think that focusing such a powerful beam of light on the asteroid would make the rock melt and evaporate, slowly changing its route. And one more way to protect ourselves from the asteroid would be to install several rocket engines on its surface. It would turn the space object into a rocket, and we could set its course from Earth. Rogue stars pose a much bigger danger. Like asteroids, they fly through space and can collide with anything in their path. The problem is that they have a gigantic mass, sometimes comparable to our suns. Around 70,000 years ago, a duo of rogue stars whooshed past the sun. It didn't affect Earth, but caused some disturbance on the outskirts of the solar system. This event is likely to happen again, someday. The rogue star Gliese 710, about half the mass of our sun, is moving toward our solar system right now. There's a possibility that it'll begin to grab asteroids from the outer asteroid belt and toss them at us. And then, rare meteor showers you can observe these days will become a regular occurrence. But right now, this rogue star is extremely far from our world. And there's a bigger chance that it'll pass by without affecting our peaceful existence. The ground shakes beneath you. The pictures rattle on the walls. You hear a rumble off in the distance. Then, boom, a deafening explosion. The shockwave blasts through the windows and sets off car alarms. You duck under the dining table for cover, but then you remember you live not far from a supervolcano in the middle of a tropical jungle. So staying in one place isn't a good idea. The shaking finally halts. You take this chance to peek outside and see a giant cloud of smoke covering the sky. It's lunchtime, but you wouldn't know it. The sun is completely veiled and darkness falls. The power's out in the whole city. In this darkness, you see red molten lava shooting from the sky and spilling on the rim. You run outside along with dozens of your neighbors. Your priority right now? Find safe shelter and fast. You think about taking the car, but with Ooh. everyone running on the road, that's a no-go. So you run on foot where the crowd is going. Super volcanoes are in a league of their own when it comes to natural disasters. Surprisingly, it's not all about size or height. A volcano is dubbed super if it erupts more than 240 cubic miles of magma. That's more than enough to overfill Lake Erie. It must also have a history of erupting and a magnitude of 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. The largest active volcano on Earth is Hawaii's Mauna Loa. It's so big, it would cover the entire state of Rhode Island plus some. And next time you see a commercial plane flying high in the sky, remember that 30,000-some-foot altitude is about as tall as Mauna Loa is from base to summit. It's technically taller than Everest when you measure it like that, yet it's not considered a supervolcano. So you're running along the dark road not knowing and barely seeing where to go. Then, all of a sudden, a massive flaming boulder smashes through the bridge in front of you. You and everyone else are now stranded on the side of the volcano, as it's getting more chaotic each second. Most of the crowd disperses, finding their own ways to safety. 
you remember there's a way to the other side not many people know about. But you'll have to cross a raging river through the dense jungle. You calm what's left of the crowd, and everyone follows you to your secret getaway. You finally get out of the city limits and head into the jungle. With the sky already dark, the tall trees and thick leaves make it almost pitch black. Everyone gets out their phone flashlights to navigate through the dark path. You all need to stick together and make sure nobody gets lost. Suddenly, fiery rocks strike the trees not far from you. Everyone jolts and tries to rush ahead. But nowhere is safe when it's raining scalding fire all around. You and your group have to pick up the pace or else. Imagine a typical avalanche or mudslide. Very dangerous situations on their own. Now, imagine an avalanche of lava rocks and lava sliding down a mountain instead of mud. That's what's making its way towards you right now. More and more people catch up with your group and bring news that the entire neighborhood is submerged in lava. It's traveling quicker than you thought. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can move slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous problem. If you didn't have protection, the gases spewing from the eruption would fill your lungs, and those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Your eyes and throat would be itchy. You'd get a headache, dizziness, increased heart rate, difficulty breathing. The worst would be passing out from the lack of oxygen. Luckily, everyone managed to grab their gas masks before leaving their homes. You're now entering the treacherous terrain of the jungle and the danger zone. Everyone's phone batteries are giving out one by one, so your vision is even more limited. The terrain is tougher, and you can't hear any sounds from the river. At this point, you're not even sure if you're going the right way. But your instincts tell you the deeper you go, the safer you'll be. The path is muddy, and the vines are hindering everyone's movements. That's when you hear something big running through the jungle. It's coming up on you fast. You can't see a thing until it's right up on you. A bear! And there goes a rhino! Wild cats, domestic cats, dogs, different creatures of all sizes and species. They all come running through the jungle right past you. You and your fellow humans aren't the only ones fleeing from the eruption. The rumbling is still going on. Before you know it, a shower of fire rocks strikes right behind you and ignites parts of the jungle. There's no going back. Everyone picks up and runs for it. You hear thunder in the distance. A flash of lightning lights up the dark sky. You think, finally, some rain to wash away this fiery nightmare. But that's not a regular storm brewing. These giant smoke clouds can mimic a thunderstorm under similar conditions. Your luck finally pays off. You hear the river straight ahead. You reach the bank and have to hop on some stones to get to the other side. You almost slip when someone from the group catches you just in time. Whew, that was too close. Not far down the river is a large waterfall leading straight to a shallow lake with sharp rocks at the bottom. The ash from the lava falls like snow, covering most of the trees and landing on the river. Ash is one of the most dangerous things about volcanic eruptions. You're soaked to the bone, but it's a lot better than ash and smoke. And then the rest of the group follow. The next thing you know, the river starts steaming as lava meets the bank and runs into the water. You try your best to speed things up. The lava can heat this water up to dangerous levels, and there are still people slowly crossing the river on the slippery rocks. Luckily, you manage to get everyone across. Well, almost everyone. You turn around and see someone's leg got caught between two rocks. The lava continues to pour into the river. You can feel the heat of the steam. You rush back to this person and try to pull them out. Their leg won't bud. Someone else from the group comes to help, and you're finally able to pull them out in the nick of time. You and everyone else, now exhausted from your trek, keep going as far as possible. That's when you see the main road that connects you to the broken bridge. There are others on the road that got out safely, and even some cars filling up with survivors and heading fast out of the area. The volcano is still spewing lava, and the entire city is flooded with it. What was once your town now looks like a giant burning lake. 
Airplanes and helicopters can't fly because of the smoke and ash, so don't count on an air rescue. You're still at risk even though you're on safer ground, so it's still too early to celebrate. Everyone continues to move away from the city. The further, the better. The ground continues to shake, but this time it's even more intense than before. Supervolcanoes are powerful enough to cause many earthquakes. But it's a good thing you're out in the open far from the buildings and debris in the city. Now, back to reality. Rest assured that a volcanic eruption of this intensity won't happen for a very long time, as in millions of years. Besides, thanks to warning systems and humanity's preparation for such an event, it's extremely rare for even a regular volcano to do as much damage as it could. So don't scratch Yellowstone off your travel list just yet. About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort Dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Vredefort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. That is how the Pingualuit crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario. But the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. 
The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds. But no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire. Almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back, and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba Crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. 
Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system. But the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. 
it's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. Asteroids flying around is sometimes like a fierce game of dodgeball, where you never know when some of them can go in your direction. So we can just track the situation and hope for the best. To figure out the risks, scientists from different organizations have to study the positions and paths of the asteroids that come close to our planet, especially those that are at least 0.6 miles wide. And the good news is that none of these asteroids will probably hit us for at least the next 1,000 years. Phew! To give us an idea of their power, Scientists did an experiment to simulate the impact of such a gigantic asteroid. The energy released from the collision would be a mind-blowing 100,000 megatons. That's like detonating 15,000 tons of dynamite. Also, if such a big asteroid hit us, Earth would cool down significantly because of all that debris that would go into the atmosphere and block sunlight. Plants wouldn't be able to get their fuel in this case, so we'd all be in trouble, both humans and animals. Thankfully, such mammoth asteroid impacts are quite rare. The larger an asteroid, the longer it takes it to collide with Earth. For example, it's estimated that asteroids with diameters of at least 0.6 miles strike our planet about once every 700,000 years. And if we're talking about even bigger ones that are 3 miles wide, well, those are predicted to come crashing down only once every 30 million years. Yay! But hold on. Don't get too relaxed just yet. Astronomers focus on really large asteroids because those are the ones that can kind of doom our planet if they hit us. Yep, you got it right, in a dinosaur kind of way. Even if one of them didn't erase us completely, the damage would still be enormous. So, there are still some asteroids wandering around that we need to keep an eye on to see how they might evolve over time. Scientists have a model of tracking them where they focus on the parts of an asteroid's path that come close to our planet 
to see if the space rock poses a risk to us. And it seems there might be one asteroid, 7482-1994PC1, 3,600 feet in diameter that might pose some danger. It's supposed to come closer to our planet in the next 1,000 years. And when I say risky, it means there's a 0.0151% chance of it coming within one Earth-Moon distance. It already passed by us in 2022, but we were lucky because it was far enough 1.2 million miles. I'd say we can relax when it comes to asteroid scenarios. For now, asteroids slamming into Earth would be new for humankind, but not for the planet itself. As I said, there weren't many of those big ones, but they still had enormous consequences. The first one that comes to most people's minds is, of course, the dinosaur asteroid as big as a mountain that struck our home planet around 66 million years ago near Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It was chaotic. Global firestorms and tsunamis were all over the place. Dust was blocking out the sun, and vaporized rock released sulfur, which then led to acid rain and the acidification of the oceans. But there was an even bigger fella that came before that one. Around two billion years ago, a gigantic asteroid crashed into our planet and left a massive crater in South Africa. The one we know today as the Redifort Crater. And it seems this asteroid might have been even bigger than we all originally thought twice as wide as the space rock that erased dinosaurs. The Redifor Crater is confirmed to be the biggest visible crater on Earth, with a diameter of about 99 miles. It used to be even bigger when it first formed, though. Maybe even 155 to 174 miles across. It's hard to figure out its true size because the crater has been eroding for the past two billion years. Think of it like slicing off layers from the rim of a bowl. The diameter gets smaller with each slice. When the asteroid, seven or five miles wide, that wiped away dinosaurs hit Earth about 66 million years ago, it caused massive destruction. Forest fires, acid rain, tsunamis, and so much ash and dust that it changed Earth's climate. This all made about 75% of life on our planet extinct. The asteroid that created the Redifort Crater was not only bigger, but it also traveled at a higher speed, which means the consequences there would have been even worse. But it happened a long time ago, and living beings were different back then. Maybe it was some bacteria that didn't even notice that something unusual was happening. Earth is not the only one. Lots of impacts have happened across our solar system too. For example, in our close neighborhood. Yup, moving to Mercury and its massive crater called the Caloris Basin. It measures about 950 miles across, which is more than the state of Texas. There's a ring of towering mountains around the crater which makes it look even more impressive. You can see different colors in the mosaic image of the Caloris Basin. They tell us more about the geology of the basin. The orange parts represent lava that once flooded the basin. These lava flows covered the original surface and added this specific orange hue. And after the lava flooded the basin on Mercury, smaller craters formed on top of the lava surface. These craters dug into the ground and uncovered the material hidden beneath the lava. Some of this material is blue in color. And this blue stuff could be a clue about what the original floor of the basin had looked like before the lava covered it. Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system, has a thick atmosphere that comes with a pretty good defense system against space rocks. It's so dense that it burns up most meteors before they even reach its surface. As a result, you won't see as many visible craters on Venus as on other rocky planets in our solar system. But Venus still has some scars that can tell us about some serious impacts that happened there. And one of the biggest scars we know about is Mead Crater. It's enormous, about 170 miles in diameter. The inner floor of this crater is relatively flat and kind of brighter than its surroundings. It's possible that the crater ended up filled with a mixture of melted rock after the impact and maybe even lava from volcanic activity on Venus. Want to get an idea of what Earth might look like without its protective layer called atmosphere? Just take a look at the moon. Its surface is littered with impact craters. This Tycho is one of the craters you'll easily notice on the moon. When you look at the full moon, you can spot it as a distinct circle with bright rays that radiate outward, slightly off-center on the lower left side of the moon. This crater, 53 miles wide, has a beautiful central peak in the middle that's topped with an intriguing boulder. The size of this boulder is impressive. It would fill about half of a typical city block here on Earth. When talking about craters, we definitely can't leave out Mars. The red planet has a much thinner atmosphere than Earth. When spacecraft approach Mars, they rely on the planet's atmosphere to slow them down as they enter it. And indeed, the atmosphere helps slow spacecraft down during landing. 
but it's still not thick enough to completely protect Mars from all those space rocks that are coming all the time. From July to September 2018, a dark spot appeared on the southern pole of Mars. It consists of two distinct patterns. A theory says that the bigger, lighter colored blast pattern can be the result of an impact shock wave scouring the ice surface. The impact generated winds that spread out and scoured the ice. The inner blast pattern, which is darker in color, occurred because the impacting object managed to penetrate the thin ice layer. As it hit the surface, it sent dark sand and debris flying. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies, forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking 
as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees. But at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks could live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet.
Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. 
That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks can live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame, an electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. 
The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. Swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly 1,000 feet beneath the surface, with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Lescantire Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day, making it way more dramatic and monochrome. The Georgia Guide Stones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 and was built the last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land, including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind, too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic, with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, unusually cold weather in the northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called the Sueda salsa dwells in the salt water. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the stone of Davasco in Argentina. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. 
People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So, even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Socotra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the Dragon Tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight-burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world! The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity. A human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it! Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. The ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. Alert! Alert! Leave all your things behind and find safety immediately! The southern continent has just erupted! This is not a drill! You see people running around, screaming their heads out. Cars bumping into each other. The whole nation is in panic. You're on the southern coast of Australia, but the sky is black and it stretches further than your eye can see. Your friend in southern India calls you and says the same thing. There's ash in the sky, and it's raining down on you. You hear rumbling in the distance, and it isn't even your stomach to blame. Everyone starts running inland. The black clouds swallow up everything in sight. Cars, trees, buildings. You're unable to see anything in front of you. Everyone's confused and scared. A tsunami breaches the shores, covering everything in its path. This is the Great Antarctic Eruption. Antarctica is that big continental desert covered in ice. In fact, it's technically the largest desert in the world. It's also covered with a whole lot of volcanoes, just chilling around. Scientists discovered that there are 138 volcanoes in Antarctica, 91 of which are hidden beneath the icy surface and 47 on top. And there might even be more. 
but most of these volcanoes are dormant. And for a volcano to be dormant, it has to be fast asleep for the last 50,000 years. The last volcano eruption was Mount Erebus in the western part of the continent. It's the most active volcano in the south side of the world and is roughly 12,500 feet above sea level. That's as high as stacking the Burj Khalifa on top of itself five times. There's a whole bunch of these volcanoes stretched across the entire continent. In the most concentrated region, the volcanoes spread the distance equivalent to that between Canada and Mexico. And that's not even all of them. Scientists have warned that if any of these interior ice-contained volcanoes were to erupt, they'd melt the western Antarctic part of the land and increase the spill of ice into the ocean. It would raise the sea level and flood many endangered lands that are already at risk. And that's not mentioning the tectonic plates shifting underneath the surface, which allows some of the magma to squeeze its way to some surfaces. It's scary enough to expect what would happen if a huge volcano erupted. But what would happen if all the volcanoes in the Antarctic continent erupted at the same time? If you were one of those scientists on a boat on their way to conduct some experiments, you would begin to feel unease. You'd notice the water carrying a bit more of the current than usual. You look at your fellow scientists, and they too have the same look on their faces. As you land at the shore and take out all your tools and equipment, things don't seem normal. But the work has to be done. You head to the base and settle in, business as usual. In the barren land, you see some emperor penguins waddling around, hunting, playing, and doing penguin stuff. But as you look around, you notice that the penguins all suddenly head to the ocean, and many of the wild Antarctic birds also begin flying towards the horizon. Weird. Then the ground starts shaking, and behind you appears a tower of smoke reaching to the sky. The ashes from a volcano can be very harmful for anyone with lung conditions, and even healthy people. The gases that come with it are usually blown away quickly, but are also harmful to humans and cause irritation to the eyes and throat. But if you're nearby, you may need a gas mask. Or better yet, evacuate! The gases and ashes are the most dangerous part of a volcanic eruption. Even though the lava spewing and explosion may seem scary, the smoke in the sky can spread far away and even halt planes flying around. You look to your fellow scientists, and they signal to you that it's time to go. Make like the penguins and swim off. But the waters are extremely rough, and the rumbling's getting louder and louder. Suddenly, you see more smoke wafting towards the sky, but from different locations. Back to the boat! It's sad to say, but leaving all that equipment was needed to survive. Carrying all that stuff would have slowed you down. But you're safe. For now. Looking behind you, you see a dark smoke screen covering every corner of the continent. Volcanoes have different types of eruptions. It's not just the shooting out lava into the sky scenario. They can range from aggressive to calm. Some spew out lava and some don't. This all depends on the environment, the number of gases contained, or if there's any groundwater present, and even the chemistry of the magma. So chances are you'd be seeing all various types of explosions around you. You're out of Antarctica's mainland, but it's surrounded by lagoons and giant ice caps all around. You're doing your best to maneuver around them. But the ash is falling down all around. The sky is dark as the smoke blocks out the sun. Volcanic ash comes in all sizes and can cause different damage, from as little as lung and eye irritation to smothering vegetation and crops. And that's just the thing. More often than not, these volcanic ashes are extremely thick. They can even collapse the roofing of some buildings if a lot of ash is accumulated. Not to mention blocking roads and compromising aquatic life. And that flash in the sky isn't your imagination. Ash clouds in the sky are so powerful that they create electrical fields that can create lightning storms. And these bad boys can interfere with radio signals and even start fires. Also, these clouds are extremely hot on their own. As if that lava flow isn't enough to start any fires. Oh well. But there are some volcanoes that are explosive. And along with the ashes flying around, there are flying rocks. This overheated rubble comes striking down like meteoroids from the sky. 
and can be pretty dangerous. You see the rocks hit the surrounding ice caps and water around you. As you reach a somewhat safe zone, you see the volcanoes all nicely lined up behind you, spewing all that thick red gooey fire. But the water tide isn't exactly peaceful. Volcanoes near oceans and seas can even cause tsunamis. Great! Submarine earthquakes shake the ocean bottom and produce large, powerful waves. And don't even think about surfing on them. If there are volcanoes spitting out red-hot lava, then why hasn't all the ice in Antarctica melted? The answer lies beneath the Earth's surface. Tectonic plates barely move underneath there. It's pretty safe to say they're stable. So for such a large piece of land, the coldest continent on Earth, the few active volcanoes are insufficient to melt all the ice. The real reason why the ice is melting and water levels are rising is the warm ocean current around Antarctica. But this time, they're all erupting at the same time. With the volcanoes discovered, who knows how many are left underground, covered in ice. And that's the scary part. Some of these volcanoes are hidden so deep beneath the icy surface that they now heat up from the lava spewing out. The ice begins to destabilize everything around. The ice on the ridges begins cracking open little by little. Like giant cans of soda bursting open, lava shoots from the snowy depths causing enormous cracks in the ground. And then, magma finds its way to the party. This uninvited guest will begin to melt the surroundings, causing the ground to destabilize even more. Slowly but surely, the ice around Antarctica will melt. And if all the ice is melted, the Earth's sea level would rise by around 230 feet. That means coastal cities would be submerged underwater. The ocean currents would be flipped around and hurricanes and typhoons would not want to take a break. Marine life would be in danger, and many small islands would completely disappear. And not to mention the smoke in the air that would travel around the world, halting many flights in the southern region. And if the winds were strong enough, the whole world. The economies would flop, and a worldwide panic would begin. Health emergencies all year round. Yeah, a real nice picture. This is not some hypothetical situation or fairy tale. The Vesuvius supervolcano that erased the city of Pompeii may wake up again and destroy many other towns built near the mountain. And to understand what consequences humanity would face if it wakens this time, it's smart to know what the eruption did 2,000 years ago with the ancient city. So Pompeii was a thriving city in the Roman Empire located just 5 miles from Vesuvius on the west coast of Italy. It was a resort where the noblest and richest people rested. They walked along cozy streets, lived in beautiful villas, and had fun beside fountains. The soil in this region was fertile since the ground around the volcano had a lot of useful elements. Olives and grapes from Pompeii were sold throughout the empire. About 12,000 people lived in Pompeii by the time of the eruption. It seems not so much compared to modern standards, but it was considered a big city in those days. The catastrophe began unexpectedly in 79 CE. At first, everyone felt the ground tremble. Birds flew away from the volcano as far as possible. There was tension in the air because of the impending catastrophe. The volcano started to release thick smoke, soot, and ash there was so much of it that soon it obscured the sky over the city with a heavy gray cloud. Vesuvius spat out gases, rocks, and dirt. Hot ash polluted the air and made it difficult for people to breathe. Locals couldn't see inside this gray haze. And then it started raining heavily. The water mixed with ash and soot and fell on Pompeii. Roofs of houses broke under the heavy weight of mud. Streets, fountains, alleys, and squares were hidden under millions of tons of soot. The next day, the destruction continued with renewed force. There was an explosion of hot gas and crushed rock at the top of the mountain. A devastating blast wave at a speed of 100 miles per hour dispersed in all directions and vaporized all the trees in its path. When the wave reached Pompeii, it turned the city into ruins. On the second day, the eruption stopped. By this time, 
the great town had been lying under a thick blanket of ash. By the way, this type of eruption is called an explosive one. But when lava flows out of a volcano and causes a fire, this is a quiet eruption. The last time Vesuvius erupted was in 1944. But even today, it's still one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. But nobody's afraid of it. Three million people live around the mountain, about 20 miles from the crater. If the volcano wakes up, it could be one of the most enormous cataclysms in the modern world. Pompeii was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago. Since then, science and technology have advanced a lot. We're planning to colonize Mars someday. We've created a metaverse. But so far, we're still powerless before the forces of nature. An erupting supervolcano can destroy nature around it and cause technogenic catastrophes in big cities. The phone lines would be overloaded and people wouldn't be able to call their loved ones or the rescue services. There would be big traffic jams on the roads. Panic would spread throughout the streets. Fires would start because of falling hot soot. All flights would be canceled, and locals would have to hide in airports, supermarkets, and the subway. A large gray cloud would obscure the sun and make the air hot. The only thing that can help us in such a situation is a preliminary warning about the upcoming eruption and good preparation. So if the disaster starts while walking on the streets, you should take shelter in a car or building. It's better to buy a dusk mask in advance that allows you to breathe freely. If there's no mask, cover your nose and mouth with any cloth. If you stay at home, close all doors and windows so volcanic ash can't get into your apartment or home. These incandescent particles can easily set fire to a carpet or curtains. Put wet towels under the door sills. If you need to go outside for some reason, wear a suit covering your body completely. Don't forget about the protection for your eyes. Put on special glasses that have a dustproof function. And remember about the mask. If you have a house, you need to disconnect the downpipes from the gutters to avoid clogging the drains. If your house has a rainwater collection system, you need to disconnect the pipes from the tank. Rain with ashes is a hot, dense mess that can easily break the water supply system. Fill the tub and sink to have water for washing and cleaning in case the central water supply is turned off. Set the lowest temperature on the fridge and freezer. Your food will be stored much longer if electricity is shut down in the city. Go to a room without windows above ground level and wait for a message from authorities on the radio or TV. Keep the receiver close to you so you don't miss anything important. The device must have a full charge, a strong body, and a powerful antenna. Here's an excellent option for survival in the ash apocalypse. The eruption is intensifying, and you hear on the radio about the evacuation. At this point, you need to calm down and follow the instructions from rescuers. Collect a bag at home with food, water, and medical supplies. Your emergency kit should include flares, maps, a first aid kit, sleeping bags, flashlights, a fire extinguisher, a portable phone charger, car tools, and a few charged batteries. You should always have a filled gasoline canister if you live near an active volcano. Going to the gas station is not a good idea during the evacuation. You can get into a long traffic jam and spend too much time in it. If you don't have a car, ask your friends for help or pay someone for a ride. It's possible the city administration would organize buses for evacuation. You would find out about it through the radio. In any case, before leaving the house, don't forget to turn off the gas and electrical devices and shut off the valve with the water supply to prevent your home from a gas leak or flooding. Government officials. So, you're driving a car. The authorities must announce the plans for evacuation. Don't go off the route because some roads can be blocked. Perhaps they will say the eruption is over and you can return home. Maybe the eruption will be so strong that it will destroy the city. Anyway, if you're prepared, you'll have fewer things to worry about. Modern seismic sensors monitor the fluctuations of tectonic plates 
and the volcano's activity, so the eruption won't be a surprise. Pompeii is far from the only city destroyed by the eruption. In 1785, a similar disaster occurred in the Japanese town of Aogashima. It was located right in the crater of an active volcano, and one day it woke up. It was sunny weather, and no one suspected a disaster was coming. At some point, the birds rose in the air and flew away. Then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from the depths of the island, and thick streams of smoke and ash erupted from the volcano. The volcano threw dirt and big red-hot stones into the sky. It looked like a meteor shower. People evacuated, and the mountain continued to erupt for several weeks. When the ashes settled, the volcano fell asleep again, and people began to return to their city. Despite the risk of a new eruption, they continue to live and work there today. Since then, more than 200 years have passed, and the volcano never woke up. Meteorological and seismological services monitor the situation and seismic activity. After all the horrors and devastation that a volcanic eruption leads to, harmony in nature eventually comes. Decades and centuries later, volcanic ash, rich in helpful food elements, settles on the soil and makes it fertile. Then life will rise from the ashes like a phoenix.